John Stephen Akwari was an athlete who trained all his life for the Olympics. He was a marathon runner in the late 60s. Perhaps you haven't heard of his name, but he was someone that you should hear about. He had trained all his life for the Olympics, and when he finally arrived in Mexico City, he was excited to represent his country of Tanzania in the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. As the race started off, he was doing pretty well. He was in the middle of the pack of race, racers that were trying to compete for the front of the race and to win the race. And then something unpredictable happened. Well, first of all, he had not been used to training in high altitudes, and so he was starting to feel that, that struggle that you would have if you're running in high altitudes, and so he was struggling with that. But while he was in a pack trying to set up his own position in the race, he got bumped, and he fell. And he hurt not only his shoulder, but also his knee. What would you do? You've trained all your life for this event. What would you do? Well, this is what Stephen, John Stephen Akawari did. At the 1968 Mexico City Marathon, three men earned the right to stand on the victory platform. The winners of the gold, silver, and bronze Olympic medals. But for some, the reward is a personal one. The knowledge that they finished what they set out to do. A little over an hour after the winner of the marathon crossed the finish line, John Stephen Aquari of Tanzania approaches the stadium, the last man to complete the journey. A voice calls from within to go on, and so he goes on. finish the race. Those words, I think, help us understand in many ways what the Apostle Paul is going to be teaching us today in Philippians chapter 3. As you open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians is one of those books in the New Testament we call epistles or letters. This is actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi. Uh, and the Apostle Paul is teaching the church in many ways, about what it means to experience change in their lives. And I'll have all the Scripture up for you on the screen that we're going to be covering today. But it's all, if you have a Bible, it's also good to be opening that up. The Apostle Paul, in some ways, is saying exactly what this, this marathon runner is saying. I press on. I press on toward the goal. I don't give up. God has called me not just to start the race, which is the Christian life. He's called me to finish it. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Today we want to talk about how we can be determined in our pursuit 
of Jesus Christ and how we can be understanding the direction that we have to head toward. The direction is toward the finish line, toward the goal, toward the prize of receiving Christ Jesus and His riches in our lives. That's what the Christian life is about. The Christian life is really not a sprint, it's a marathon. And along the way, we can experience a number of different hazards. But God has sent Jesus Christ into our lives. God has sent His one and only Son so that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has sent Jesus into our lives not just so that we would start the Christian life, but that we would finish it. I want to think with you today about what it means to be finishing the race that is the Christian life. As we continue to think about this topic of changing on purpose, we are studying the, the chapter of Philippians chapter 3. Previously, several years ago, we did a series on the whole book of Philippians. We're just focusing on this month for the next, this Sunday and next Sunday we'll be finishing up on Philippians chapter 3 and looking at what the Apostle Paul has to say about changing on purpose. How do we, how do we have the right attitude toward change, especially as we start the new year, but really at any time in our life? And what's interesting, in the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 verse 15, all of us who are mature should, should have this or take an attitude like this. He's giving us an attitude about life and about what change, changing on purpose looks like. He's telling us if you want to have an attitude which makes sure that you get to the finish line in the Christian life, have this attitude that I'm describing in Philippians chapter 3. And I'm calling it changing on purpose because it helps us understand what change looks like and, and how we can move toward change. And, and one of the, there's three elements to this changing on purpose that I think the Apostle Paul lays out for us. And we've already looked at the first one, which is admission. A frank and honest and transparent admission of where we are, of recognizing our need for change. Before we can change, we have to understand that we have a need to change. And, and the Apostle Paul, as great as he was in the Christian life, was very much honest and was willing to admit that even he needed to change. Remember what he said? Not that I've already obtained this, or I'm already perfect. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. The Apostle Paul was willing to admit that he was imperfect. And the Christian life, it has to be lived with that admission of where we are, that we all need change. No matter where we are in the Christian life, no matter how long we live the Christian life, we all need to experience change and we have to be open and admit that need for change. The Apostle Paul did that. You can, you can admit that you aren't, you aren't perfect, but the Apostle Paul didn't settle for complacency. And so the Apostle Paul pursued the change that he was after. And we're going to talk about that today. That's the second element, pursued. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about pursuing changing on purpose. But there's a third element that we will talk about next week, an attitude that we have to have in the Christian life and in our mind to experience changing on purpose, and that is this idea of community. We're going to talk about that in detail next week. But the Christian life is not meant to be lived isolated. We must experience this change in a community where we're able to work together and to help one another. And so the, the, G, Paul says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model. You know, sometimes when we want to experience change, we need to find someone who has experienced that change and go after it with them, following them as an example. And then trying to be an example to others. He says, keep your eye on those who also live the way I do. So we'll talk in detail about this idea of community, a community that's necessary to experience change. So there's admission, there's a frank admission of where we are. We need the change and we have to acknowledge that. And then thirdly, there's a community that we need to experience change change. But that second element of change that we looked at last week and will continue to look at this week is this idea of pursuit. What kind of attitude do we have to have to experience change? The Apostle Paul says we have to have a, a determination, a determination and a direction for change. Notice what he says, I press on 
to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. But one thing I do. The Apostle Paul is using the analogy of the athlete running the race. That's exactly what that word press on means. It was used in his day to refer to a runner who would continue to press on. He's he's wanting us to think about an athlete like John Stephen Akawari. He wants us to think about the athletes of his day that would press on. What does that look like? I want to think with you a little bit about the pursuit and understand that that Paul is talking about a determination and a direction for change that we have to pursue if we're to experience this kind of Christ-likeness that Paul is seeking after and wants us to be seeking after. So Paul says, I, each one of us, has to make that decision You know, we can't can't make a decision that others will change around us. See, sometimes in the Christian life what happens is is we, we, we know we have problems, but we say, but it's hers, or it's his, or it's theirs, right? And so we say, well, you know, things would change in my life if only he or only she, right? Have you ever said that? No, none of you? Wow, you guys are, that'd be great. Um, But sometimes we look at others. But Paul isn't, there's, there's times to do that. But Paul is saying, I, see each one of us has to decide that we determine that I am going to press forward. And so again, he uses that image of pressing forward, of exerting great energy, a determined effort to experience the change that we're longing for. To be more Christ-like is the goal of the Christian life, but how many of us think each day about the determined way that we will pursue Christ? That's what the Apostle Paul is encouraging each one of us do, to take a determined pursuit and effort. And, And what are we to do? We're to take hold, to grab, to hold on, to grab and hold on to what? To grab and to hold on to the salvation and the sanctification that God has made available to us in Jesus Christ. Because Christ has already took hold of us. We're just grabbing him, but he's holding us. Do you see this picture that the Apostle Paul, he's saying, now it, you know, maybe there's this analogy of grabbing for the baton. But we're not grabbing for a thing, we're grabbing for a person. We're grabbing for all that this person will do in our lives. We're grabbing for Jesus Christ. We're trying to take hold of Him, but He's he's already grabbing us. See, this is the Christian life. So so who's responsible for the change in our lives? It's it's Jesus Christ who took hold of me, but I'm to grab and to to grab and hold on to Him as well. So there has to be that, that grab and that pull and that holding. We're determined to pursue Jesus Christ, determined effort. So often in the Christian life, we, we, we give our lives to Jesus Christ. And I, I don't know, I hope everyone here today has had a moment in their life where they have acknowledged their sin, recognized their need of a Savior, and called upon that Savior to save them. And if you haven't, today can be that day that you would do that. And you would take hold of Christ. You would say, Oh God, I'm a sinner and I need a savior, Jesus. And you grab out and you reach out to the lifeguard, Jesus, and he grabs you and he saves you from the clutches of evil in your life and you experience that that forgiveness and that, that beginning of a new life. But sometimes we think, okay, that's over. Now what else do I move on to? No, you don't stop grabbing and holding on to Jesus. You keep reaching for him. The Christian life is is not about moving on to something else. Jesus is the all in all. We keep striving for Jesus, keep striving to experience him each and every day. It's a determined effort on our part. I press on, the Apostle Paul says. I exert determined effort like an athlete to reach out for Jesus because he's reaching out for me. This determined effort is so important in the Christian life. And we press on to win the prize, the goal for which Christ has called us heavenward. 
Again, the Apostle Paul is thinking about the analogy of his day, the athletic competition and how r- runners would run the race and they would run to win the prize. And what was the prize in those days? It was actually kind of a wreath that they would wear. It was a wreath that would symbolize that they had won today. You know, we have gold, we have silver and bronze hanging from our neck. But in those days, it was a wreath. It was a, it was a wreath which signified that that athlete had won that race and that competition. And that's why the Bible talks about crowns. That's why it says we're striving to to reach the prize. And it talks about the prize in terms of a crown because it was like a wreath that you would wear. That was a kind of prize that you would get in the race. And Paul is saying we're striving not just to, to start the race, but to finish the race, a determined effort to get to the finish line. The Christian life is not just about starting well. It's about ending well. It's about experiencing all that God has for us. But that's going to require determined effort on our part. And yes, the continual role and work of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you today, what goal, what prize are you striving for in the Christian life? I mean, do you have a determined effort to be seeking everything that Christ has for you, to be experiencing it in in new measure, in new ways, to be experiencing the reality of Jesus Christ, or, as so many of us often do, because we don't think much about it, we're just going through the motions. Well, it's Sunday. It's a nice day. I'll come to church, and I'll go through. And we're glad you're here. Don't get me wrong. But, but, but is, there a, is there a goal, is there an effort, is there, is there a purpose beyond the activities of Christianity? So many of us can get caught up in what we could call churchianity. Just going through the motions. I'm supposed to go to church, I'm supposed to pray, I'm supposed to read my... Why? What are, what are you trying to experience? What am I trying to experience? It's Christ-likeness that we're trying to experience. It's, it's reaching for the goal and the prize so that at the end of our lives, Jesus can say, well done, good and faithful servant. Experiencing the grace of God, reaching for it. In what sense are we reaching for what God has for us? The reality is, I think so many of us, myself included, we often settle for the good when God wants the best for us. What's the difference between the good and the best in your life? So many of us strive for the good. We'll settle for that. But, but Paul was striving and reaching for the best in his life. He wanted to experience Christ in full measure in his life. He wanted to run the race to the end, to get to the finish line, to receive the prize, the wreath, and he wanted to be able to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And so he had a determined effort. I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul says, but one thing I do. He had a determined focus. He understood that everything that he did in life focused around one thing. What was that one thing? To experience the reality of Jesus Christ in his life. Sometimes we wonder why the Apostle Paul was such an amazing, amazing missionary and Christian. In some ways you could say the Apostle Paul was the greatest Christian who ever lived. Well, the Apostle Paul tells us that he had a determined focus. He went through his life saying, but one thing I do. The reality is, is so many of us say, but seven things I do today. You know, we go, we manage our lives by a task list, right? Right? And and that's okay, we all have task lists. But I believe the Apostle Paul knew how to take his task list and, and focus in on the thing that mattered the most. How does each thing that I do, and don't get me wrong, he was busy all the time, but how did he take all that busyness and focus it in on the one thing? So that if there are things on my task list that actually prevent me from focusing on the one thing, what has to go? My one thing or the task on that list? See, he was able to say, I will will have all my life filtered through one thing. That one thing was seeking after Christ. And we can do that in a variety of ways. I mean, you could be out in the business world. You can be out in the construction world. You can be out in school. You can still do that one thing and, of course, do many other side things. 
But, but in what sense are we focusing everything we do on knowing Christ and experiencing His reality more and more in our lives? That's what the Apostle Paul was striving to do. But one thing I do. And so changing on purpose requires determination. Determination. The Apostle Paul shows us that it's reaching, it's pressing after Christ. It's focusing on the one thing that matters the most in the end. But do you know what? The Christian life also requires direction. Where is our focus and direction in life? Now, every one of you that came in a car today had something like this, the scene when you started the day, right? You got in your car, big windshield, rearview mirror. Okay? What direction did you go? Well, some of you say, well, I turned left on this road and I went north. No, I, I, I'm saying, did you go forward? Well, some of you had to back up a little bit, right? But eventually to get here to church, you went forward, right? What did you use to drive forward? Did you look through your rearview mirror all the way here? Did you use that as the focal point of your direction? Like, you're driving along, but you're driving with your rearview mirror. Wow, look at those people. I just passed that person. I passed that. And, you know, no, of course. You're saying, like, that's, that's silly. That's dumb, Alex. What are you talking about? Well, because we don't drive with our rearview mirror. We drive with our windshield. We drive by looking what's ahead, right? Now, occasionally, you've got to look back, especially when, you know, you're at a stop, and, and it just barely turns green and then honk, you know, like, come on, hurry up, I gotta go. And then you look in the back to see who that was who greeted you so nicely, and then you move on, right? But, but we don't focus, we don't drive by, by focusing on the back. Occasionally we do that for reference point, but we focus on what's ahead. Sometimes when we're in a counseling situation, I try and use that analogy. I say, okay, I say, listen, we can focus on the, on the rearview mirror about everything that's happened before, and there's a, there's a place for that. But can we focus on the windshield? Can we focus on what's ahead? Because the only thing you can do about changing your life sometimes is to focus on what's ahead. Yes, you need the, the back of you. You need to pass as a reference point at times. But you need to focus on moving ahead, on what's ahead of you. Notice what the Apostle Paul says about direction. He says, about my past, about my windshield, he says, I'm forgetting what's behind. When we go through life, and if we've lived long enough in the Christian life, and even if we've lived for a time outside of Christ, it makes it sometimes even harder. Like the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul was a persecutor of the church, and now he was a preacher. Do you think, at times, that he thought about his past? What does it mean to forget your past? Well, I don't think it means that you forget the events that have happened. The Apostle Paul actually in this chapter, in, in, in verses 4 and 5, actually describes his past pretty well. And he says, and I was a persecutor of the church. I don't think the Apostle Paul experienced amnesia where he forgot about his past. No. There are things about our lives that we cannot forget. Maybe some of us have experienced something that we didn't even do, something that was done to us, like we've experienced some kind of abuse, and, and it's hard to, hard to forget. What do you do? What do you do? How do you move forward with change? And see, part of the problem with change is that so many times we're looking in the rearview mirror all the time. We're trying to navigate our lives by looking at everything that was behind us. We're saying, but I can't change because of this. And, and I'm not trying to minimize your pain. I'm not. And I, and I do that at times. I, I think about things that are, you know, opportunities that I miss and experiences. And sometimes I let those things dwell in my mind. And I think what the Apostle Paul is saying when he says forgetting what is behind, he's saying that, that experiencing change on purpose, changing on purpose means that our direction about our past is to let those things and the impact on our lives go by the grace of God letting those things go not driving the, the direction of our lives by our by our rearview mirror 
but by looking ahead to what's in front of us in the windshield. Some of us pr- uh, sang this song, well, some of us, all of us, uh, I think, unless you got here just a little late, but you're still welcome. We sang the song, Fail Us Not. Do you really believe what you sang? Do I really believe what I sang? Listen to what we say. Failure doesn't phase you, speaking about God. Failure doesn't phase you, God. Worry doesn't win. Loss doesn't leave you afraid to start again. Our sin doesn't shock you. Our shame doesn't shame you at all. You got some sin in your life? Do you got some sin when you look in your rearview mirror? Do you got some sin? Do you got some shame? We do. We can acknowledge that. Remember, the first first part of experiencing changing on purpose is to acknowledge that, to admit that, to say, God, I've got some things in my life I'm not proud of, I'm not happy about. And and what we sang is that God can can handle that. His grace is more than sufficient. Mistakes do not move you. Terror doesn't tame. Death doesn't doom you to a life in a grave. Our sufferings don't scare you. Our secrets won't surprise you. Do we really believe that about God? Do we? Or are we focused in our rearview mirror about everything that's gone beyond, before us? And that stuff is holding us hostage to experiencing real and lasting change. Because every time we think about it, it draws us back to what was instead of what's ahead. The Apostle Paul says, forgetting what is behind. The Apostle Paul did not forget the actual facts of what he did, but he wasn't allowing those facts to control what he did going forward. Because the Apostle Paul says he's forgetting what is behind. He's straining, again, the analogy of that athletic competition, straining toward what is ahead. What's ahead? What was the head for the Apostle Paul? (coughs) The prize to experience the reality of Jesus Christ. That's what was ahead for him. <clears throat> What's ahead for you? How do you define your future? <clears throat> do you see the grace of God and the change that is possible in Jesus Christ? Is that what's driving you? Is that what you're reaching ahead for? Or are you focused on all the failure of the past? Forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead. To experience changing on purpose, we have to know the direction that we're headed in life. We have to allow the past to be forgiven, to be covered, to be renewed in Jesus Christ. And we have to strain toward what is ahead. What's the direction of life that you're headed? Are you driving your life through the rearview mirror? Or are you looking straight ahead? through the windshield to the future that God has for you in Jesus Christ. In the end, the Apostle Paul tells us what the direction of his future focus was. Again, the goal to win the prize for which Christ had called him heavenward. I guess you could say in the end, Paul's direction was he had put his GPS settings on heaven. Now, that doesn't mean that he was so heavenly minded as to be no earthly good. You know, we we don't want to be people so focused on heaven that they, they don't care at all about the earth around them and the world around them people. That was not the Apostle Paul. But for him, in focusing himself on the goal, the end, the destination, that framed every decision he made while he was headed that direction. That framed everything that he thought about his life because he looked through everything and said, how will this help me help others to get to the same direction I'm headed. And it became the focus and the direction of his life to point his life and to point others' lives toward that goal. The heavenward call in Christ Jesus. Is that the direction that you and I live our lives? Toward the prize, toward the goal 
forgetting what's behind, confessing that to the Lord, straining toward what's ahead, toward the prize, the goal of Jesus Christ being realized in our lives. At the end of the Apostle Paul's life, this was the last epistle that he wrote. Just like the epistle that we saw, the book of Philippians, written while Paul was in jail earlier, this is now Paul writing again in jail in 2 Timothy. And he knows that this time it's the end. And as he's reflecting back on his life, notice what he says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the I finished the race. I finished the course. Like, like John Stephen Akawari, the Apostle Paul was wounded. He was persecuted. He was pummeled. In some ways, the Apostle Paul was kind of limping to the finish line as he's sitting in jail. And, he, and he's saying, this is what my life has amounted to. But you know what? He wasn't giving up. He was continuing to press on toward the finish line. The Christian life is about running toward the finish line, wounded as we are, like John Stephen Akawari, just going along and noticing that, noticing that as we're running along, there's others cheering us on, and we'll talk next week about community and how that's so important. But in the end, the question is, at the end of our lives, when we look back, will we be able to say like the Apostle Paul, I finished the course, kept the faith, do we have that determined focus and effort and direction for change? That's how we will experience changing on purpose. As the worship team makes their way up for our final song today, I want to challenge you and encourage you before we close in prayer. And here's the challenge and the encouragement that I'd like to, to give to you today. It has to do with the direction of your life. I'll go back to that picture. Some of us here today have to do business with the Lord before we leave. And that business has to do with what we're seeing in the rearview mirror. And we need to give that to the Lord, forgetting what is behind. Would you, would you give to Him your sin and your shame and your failure and your mistakes? Would you give it to Him today and say, Lord, I'm forgetting what's behind and I'm going to strain toward what is ahead. Will you give it to Him today? Maybe for the first time by acknowledging that you need Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Maybe for the umpteenth time because you need to come to the Lord again and take hold of that for which Christ took hold of you. When, whatever number it is, would we all turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you and I want to look ahead to what you have for me in Jesus Christ. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, I come to you today and I acknowledge that I need to forget what is behind and strain toward what is ahead just like so many of us here today, and I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would help us to be able to do that, that you would free us from the feelings of, of guilt and even some shame and regret and remorse about our past, about what's in our rearview mirror. And with the power of the Holy Spirit and your grace washing over us to look ahead to what you have for us in Jesus Christ, to reach for Jesus, to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of us. I pray if there be anyone here today who has never come to Jesus Christ as a sinner and called upon Him to be a Savior, that today they would do that, even for the first time, even in a simple prayer. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm not happy about my past, but I give it to You, and I ask You to forgive me and cleanse me and give me a new life and a new future. And for those of us who have prayed and experienced Jesus Christ in our lives, but maybe find ourselves in a rut or just a determined renewal to experience more change. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would help us have that determined effort and focus and direction in our lives in the days ahead that we would reach for Jesus Christ, forgetting what's behind. Help us to let go of the things that hold us back and to reach for the prize of Jesus Christ. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.